A common argument for annihilation is based on the interpretation of the term destruction in the Bible. For instance, Matthew 10.28 uses the Greek word apolumi, often translated as destroy. However, a closer look at biblical usage suggests that this term implies a loss of well-being or purpose rather than ceasing to exist. In various contexts, apolumi describes things that have lost their usefulness or are separated from their intended purpose, like lost sheep or spoiled food. Thus, when the Bible talks about the destruction of the soul, it's not referring to its extinction but rather to a state of ruin or loss, especially in a spiritual sense. In 2 Thessalonians 1 9 the Apostle Paul speaks of the ungodly suffering eternal destruction. Some interpret this as meaning the wicked will eventually cease to exist. However, a deeper analysis reveals that the word destruction here, Greek olithros, historically refers to ruin or devastation, not annihilation. For example, the destruction of ancient cities like Moab didn't mean they ceased to exist, they fell into ruin, therefore, eternal destruction in this context suggests a perpetual state of ruin or suffering, not extinction. The book of Revelation refers to the second death, which is often misunderstood as annihilation. However, in biblical terms, death is frequently associated with separation rather than cessation. Physical death separates the soul from the body, and spiritual death separates a person from God. Thus, the second death can be understood as an eternal separation from God, a state of enduring spiritual death. This interpretation aligns with the broader biblical narrative, where death signifies separation and eternal life is about union with God. Though not inspired, most of the early church fathers supported the idea of eternal punishment over annihilation. They viewed terms like destruction and death in a spiritual sense, often associating them with a state of perpetual ruin or separation from God rather than a complete cessation of existence. For example, in his works like City of God, Augustine often leaned towards eternal punishment rather than annihilation. He argued that just as the soul is eternal, so is its punishment for unrepentant sin. He also viewed the second death as a continuation of spiritual death, a permanent separation from God. Regarding the word olethros, destruction, Early theologians like John Chrysostom interpreted this in the context of a state of perpetual ruin or loss, rather than complete annihilation. Chrysostom's homilies often emphasize the enduring nature of divine judgment and punishment, underscoring the gravity of sin and the need for repentance. Although some may wish to believe that the unsaved are annihilated, this belief is motivated more by human compassion than by what the scriptures teach on the subject. The Bible's references to the destruction or death of the wicked don't advocate for their annihilation. Instead, they point to a state of eternal separation and suffering, a spiritual ruin that lasts forever. This understanding emphasizes the seriousness of sin and the finality of divine judgment, urging a thoughtful consideration of spiritual choices. Furthermore, it's important to consider additional scriptural insights and interpretations that reinforce this perspective. 1. The Rich Man and Lazarus Luke 16 19 31. This parable by Jesus depicts the rich man as suffering and torment after death, indicating conscious existence rather than ceasing to exist. This story supports the ongoing suffering or separation from God, rather than annihilation. 2. The concept of eternal life, John 3 16, Matthew 25 46. These verses compare eternal life with eternal punishment implying that both are endless. 3. The nature of God's justice, Romans 2 6 8. This passage emphasizes the ongoing and dynamic aspect of God's justice. It suggests that God's judgment is an active, continual process, where He assesses individuals based on their actions and behaviors. The focus here is on the principle that God's justice is proportionate and responsive to the deeds of people throughout their lives. This view of divine justice encompasses both the mercy and righteousness of God, affirming that he rewards those who seek goodness and truth and addresses those who follow wickedness and deceit. 4. The Book of Revelation, Revelation 1 11, 20, 10, 14, 15. These passages speak of the devil, the beast, the false prophet and those not found in the Book of Life being thrown into the lake of fire. The terms used suggest ongoing torment, as in Revelation 14 11, where the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. 5. The Warnings of Jesus, Mark 9 43, 48. Jesus warns of Gehenna, hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, symbolizing an enduring state of punishment. 6. The Parable of the Sheep and the Goats, Matthew 25, 31, 46. 
Here, eternal punishment is contrasted with eternal life, again suggesting a continuous state, rather than annihilation. 7. The Immortality of the Soul The Bible speaks about the soul's inherent immortality, Ecclesiastes 12, 7, Matthew 10, 28, which means it continues to exist beyond physical death. 8. The justice and mercy of God The character of God as revealed in Scripture balances justice with mercy. The concept of eternal punishment upholds the justice of God, emphasizing the gravity and consequences of sin. 9. The Final Judgment, Revelation 2011, 15. While this passage also speaks to judgment based on deeds, it focuses on the culmination of God's justice at the end of time. The final judgment is depicted as a definitive event, distinct from the ongoing judgment process. It involves a comprehensive evaluation of every individual's life, leading to eternal consequences. This judgment results in what is referred to as the second death, understood in many Christian traditions as eternal separation from God. The emphasis here is on the finality and completeness of this judgment, marking the end of human history and the full realization of God's kingdom. 10. The Consistency of Scripture Throughout the Bible, themes of judgment, punishment, salvation and eternal life are interwoven. The consistent message is that choices in this life have eternal consequences, whether in separation from or union with God. In conclusion, while the concept of annihilation might seem more palatable to human compassion, the scriptural evidence shows that eternal punishment is an ongoing conscious existence separated from God, which emphasizes the seriousness of sin, the necessity of obeying the gospel, living a faithful life to God, and the profound implications of God's final judgment.